fitting. Well, if I talk about a plastic bag, this is not plastic. Okay, that, that is one thing that is clashing. What else is clashing? Is nobody in this room sort of imagining a cell to be some, some bag uh, with a lot of water in it? And then you, you do, right? Is it came that, did that come from you, Adele? No, you, you didn't. <laughs> Nobody in the room? I, I always picture the cell to be something sort of where, where water swims around with, with stuff, so I'm the only one. Uh, but if, if I'm not the only one, so what is it that clashes with this image here? Of proteins fold in water's, in water's environment, right? When you fold proteins in a cell, this protein is surrounded by water, all right? But the idea of a bag full of water is not fitting to this image. Why not? What, what's, what, what does this image show that is very different from a bag of water? High density. It's very densely packed, okay? Now, this is an artist rendering of a cell, David Goodsell. But David Goodsell is an expert in integrating all the scientific facts and putting them into a drawing that in fact reflects reality. So most likely, David Goodsell is a very clever guy, most likely it's true. And in fact it is true. The density in a cell is the density of a solid state, not of a liquid. Okay? The cell is as densely packed as a watch. It is true that proteins fold in aqueous environment. It is true that proteins fold in water, but it's a tiny set of water molecules. It's a, it's a sort of narrow shell around each protein. Proteins touch each other, and there's a lot of density in a cell, okay? There's also a lot of water, but there's a high, high density. And this image of a watch is a better image than the image of a bag, okay? This is what this one here says. None of them is right. But this image of a watch is actually close to explaining many aspects of a cell. This is a eukaryotic, a cut through a eukaryotic cell that is the same as before, except you have sort of subcompartments and more density. What is that? Uh, nobody? Is, is, uh, is there really nobody in the room who has seen that before? Or is it, again, how, how would be the sign if things are too trivial? Okay, I, I'd like, I really don't know whether what I'm asking you is too complicated or too trivial. Uh, sometimes people are bored when, they, when it's too trivial and then they also react that same way. And from my perspective, uh, I still don't have a feel for the room, for the group. Uh, so one of these balls here is an amino acid. It's a residue, okay? So it's a sphere that essentially, that tells you, we have a protein here, okay? A protein where every ball represents the C alpha, so the major position by which you sort of uh, can approximate an amino acid. Now, some of you may have seen enough proteins to recognize that. I, I assume from the reaction in the room that most of you have not seen millions of protein structures, so it, you did not even immediately jump to it. And some of you may not really even realize anything about symmetry. Now in the next image, all I'm going to do is, so there's one major element that you see again and again when you look at the details of 3D structure, which is a helix. So somehow you could imagine that you see something like that here. And in the next image, all I'm going to do is where there really is a helix, I put a, a rod not changing anything else. I'm essentially going to throw away the detail of these, of these spheres here. I'm replacing the spheres by where they are connected in a helix by rods. And everything where they're not connected in a helix, I'm just not going to have a ball. I'm just going to have a, 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 a chain, a simple chain. Okay? That's this one. So those are the simple chains here, and those are the big rods. Now, all of you, even if you haven't seen a protein before, see some symmetry. You immediately see the dominant rods that are there. You immediately see that there are at least sort of is a, you may suspect that in fact the red and the blue are similar. Very, very few people in the room have seen that here on that level, right? That is more reality than this, okay? Because this is more detail than the rods. 
but the rods capture something that is also reality, which is the symmetry, which is blue and red are similar, all right? That is reality. So by sort of skewing reality, by putting things into a protein doesn't have rods, okay? It's just a visual guide for a trace that I see. But these rods allow me to see elements. And those elements are real because they act together. They're real because there's a symmetry in here. Blue and red are the same, okay? Uh, simply the same chain. Uh, it's fine. Here we have a similar, uh, different molecule, the ADH, they are called the hydrogenase, where again, two molecules here come together. Uh, and the way they come together, the way the homodimer, dimer means two, homo means the same thing twice, the way the homodimer is formed makes it functional. So the protein alone, if, you, if I took away one of these uh, so chains here, one of these proteins, then it wouldn't function. It only functions as a homodimer. It functions because it has a particular shape, and in this particular shape, these two have to come together. Then it gets active and binds. It actually cuts alcohol. And that is, in fact, where the name comes from. This is the molecule ADH5. Uh, uh, is what is relevant when you had... Some of you may have seen beer in, in close to your mouth and sort of entering your body. And if you had too much of that, uh, to the point where you cannot really see what is happening, uh, then this is what you need uh, in order to feel good the next morning. And there are, there are some people who don't have the ADH5, and they, for them it's much tougher to digest alcohol. OK, now, what do you see here? This time, this is not like houses. So this time, you know, there's no simple solution. Uh, what I'm looking for, uh, unless you have seen this image before and you know the title and the name, of, uh, you will not be able to guess it. So just wild speculation. Anybody? Yeah? Bonfire. Bonfire. This is a very, I'm, I'm smiling because the fire, uh, the fire I've heard before, the bonfire is in, in addition. Yes, bonfire, okay. Something else? Fire, any other association? Okay. Um, so here's the title, Umberto Boccioni, Dynamism of a Soccer Player. Uh, now, this is not a joke, so, um, this is a 2D image, and in fact, that one is the artist impression of this photograph, okay? Uh, that is the soccer player that, who, who is shown here. Uh, now, in this 2D image, if you are not familiar with soccer, if you haven't seen this guy play, if you haven't seen situations like that, then this is a frozen object in time, and you have no idea how this guy moves. You have no idea about the way the next time point would look of this image. You have one frozen time point, and it could be that this guy is just going to stumble, okay? If you haven't seen, seen football at all, and there's this ball, and you know, if the ball is next to your, to your left foot, then, then you fall. This is the way it is. It's an object, right? Uh, and then anyway, there are these blue ones around, and they're going to make him stumble anyway. Uh, and this guy is going to pull through, because he's actually extremely good with the ball, and he's actually very good at sort of looking at the dynamic feature of a football or whatever, let's not get too, too, too upset about this. But the point is, she captured the bonfire. Uh, she captured in this image one important aspect. There is a lot of energy in this guy when he moves. This energy, if you don't know this guy, you don't see that. This is a relatively static image. And in this relatively static image, without knowing anything, this situation could be there talking essentially, or you don't see energy, okay? You see a guy who's sort of at the point of, of, of falling or something, whatever your interpretation is, this is not necessarily giving you the idea of fire, this is. If you saw the movie of this guy, then you would completely understand this idea of fire. He's full of energy, and this guy is, is an immensely good, or was an immensely good player, uh, and that is in fact the part that is captured here. The part that's supposed to be captured here is the energy of this thing, and that is what the artist thinks about when the artist sees that, because the artist sees that. 
this is not the truth. And this is not the truth. And the movie is also not the truth. There is somehow truth in, in, in all of these different ways. And the same is true for the way we present proteins. So in this particular presentation here, you have a protein structure, or more precisely, you have a bunch of superposed protein structures. Uh, the resolution is not very high. One, two, three, four, five or different chains here. Uh, and they come together. And here you see the secondary structure segments <coughs> put in where they all form beta strands. Okay? The, the arrows simplify the way this is the way you look at this sort of ensemble of structures. Okay? The ensemble itself is reality. The simplification is reality. All of that is reality. And they capture different aspects. Okay? And this, you, you may find this is very theoretical or very abstract. But the reason why I bring this is I'm going to talk about energy uh, in a few minutes. And when I talk about energy, you may feel when you see energy functions that these energy functions are reality. They are as much reality as this. They are as abstract and as close or far away from reality. When we want to talk about, as a physicist, how the Earth attracts the moon, that's a simple energy. When we talk about the protein, that is no longer simple because we have much more than a three-body problem. We have an energetically very complicated situation. And in an energetically very complicated situation, if we start with simple functions, then they are approximations. Okay? We don't know how, for an individual residue, the energy looks. Because that is an energy that we would have to see integrated over the entire system. And that's exactly what we cannot describe. So when I present to you in, in a moment simple energy, then they are as much a simplification as this, as much an abstract view. It's only that this is an abstract form that is put into math and with which biochemists argue. It's as real as this is a soccer player to the energy. That's what it, why I sort of have this part to, for you to keep that in mind. OK, we begin with amino acids. Uh, so the amino acid has two parts. There's a backbone. Here's the so-called C-alpha. That's why the H N N2 NH3 here is the reason why it's called the, the beginning of a protein is called the N-terminus. And the end is called the C-terminus. So there's an orientation. Uh, there's the side chain. The 20 amino acids differ only in the side chain. When we sort of string them up to amino acids, into, in this particular case, a dipeptide. Peptide essentially is this bond, it's a peptide bond, di2. So you put two amino acids together, it's a dipeptide. You put more together, it's a peptide. The side chain fall onto opposite sides. If the third one comes in, so the side chain would be putting in that direction, uh, and you have a sort uh, a slight angle. When we look at the bond here, uh, that, that is formed, then again, this bond sort of has different ways of looking. There's an attractive and a repulsive force. Uh, the bond you can describe, so here, looking at the C alphas, essentially, you could describe, or at the, uh, at the Cs here, you could describe this like that, like that, or like an electron density map. And again, none of these realities is really more better than the others. Uh, the reality is sort of a mixture model of these two. They captured three different ways of the bond feature. Okay? What this one captures very well is that there has to be a minimal distance. What this one captures very well is that the uh, way these two bonds overlap, in fact, is such that the spheres, the electron density spheres, do overlap. And we have, in fact, the captured electron here that provide the, uh, the strength of binding, essentially, is the degree of overlap of these two clouds. What this model ultimately shows is similar to that one, except for it really gives you the cloud, the idea of a cloud more clearly, the idea of a, a probability more clearly, where this one looks like a hard shell ping pong ball, right? But ultimately, they are all the same approximations, or they are all different approximations. Uh, again, uh, now we are stringing up to, to three here. So that the two main elements, the backbone, the side chain, uh, and we string them up like this. Uh, so there's an N-terminus, a C-terminus. The, the double bond here uh, is the one that creates the amide bond. And 
the way you string them up, you essentially have an alignment of, so the, the way you can string them up has a limited number of orientation possibilities. So the way, since this is a double bond, the double bond cannot completely be rotated. Okay? You have a limitation in the way, by the fact that this is a double bond, you have a limit in the, in the uh, rot rotate, rotatability of this bond. And that, in fact, puts the peptide bond itself, the binding, into a plane. Okay? Ultimately, again, back to this double bond here. We tend to sort of rationalize this by physical chemistry or by physical features. So just look at a covalent bond here. At a covalent bond, we essentially have two different forces. We have an attractive force uh, of the electron and the proton. You have a repulsive force here of the two protons from each other. That's essentially the kind of bond that, that I just showed you. Uh, and typically, we describe this here as isolated atoms. We describe this in, as, a, as an energy wall. So you get too close, then you hit a wall, but essentially here sort of is the, the lowest energy, so this is in fact where the bond ideally will sit. Now this again does not mean that this in fact is exactly the distance at which it will sit, this is just the highest probability, right? And it will oscillate around this highest probability. That's the simple story on a level of, of two protons, uh, H2. Uh, so in a, in a double bond, this, the story gets slightly different. Uh, again, here's the, 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 pl the planner way of, of doing it. You can compute the, the joules. Uh, and then there is a delocalization. So it's a, again, it's a probability in, in, in which you sort of put this, this electron around. The electron doesn't belong to a particular point. Uh, the double bond doesn't belong to a particular position. There's a probability of a double bond. That, in fact, uh, is a polar bond here. Uh, which is in fact the dipole element. So there is, through the polarity of the electron cloud, you have different orientations. The less or higher probability of the electron cloud creates a dipole moment. Two dipoles attract each other in opposite ways. Uh, that then there's an ionic, a Coulomb potential is an ionic interaction. There's positives and negatives. It's just attractive. You fall into the attractive point. Again, then there is some, some wall uh, where you sort of clash the atoms in, uh, in, into each other. And then there is sort of a combination of these forces that I showed is the Leonard Jones potential. So you fall, and then you sort of have a repulsive part. Uh, and that typically, this Leonard Jones potential is used to describe proteins. That gets us into the strength of bonds. Uh, there's a high degree of diversity of the strength of these bonds, uh, where the, the covalent bond, the electron sharing, is, is the highest, then comes the hydrogen bond, uh, and then comes the van der Waals energy, or van der Waals bond, and you see that there is a scale of magnitude in between those. The most often observed bond in a protein is the, are the hydrogen bonds. This is what stabilizes secondary structure. We will get back to that. Uh, these are sort of the strongest, but relatively rarely observed so covalent bonds. Uh, and van der Waals, uh, again, they work through essentially masses. Hydrogen bond uh, shown here, electrostatic interaction in a salt bridge, lysine and glutamic acid here in this particular example. Uh, here in a salt bridge in a 3D structure. Uh, pi pi interactions, let's, let's, I, I believe I'm going to zip over it. Uh, so typical bond in, in the sense of most often seen is the hydrogen bond. Ionic interactions are prevalent. We see them very often. We will have examples for that. Uh, and then there are sort of metal complexes, cation, uh, pi, uh, so different types, back, back to the bonds, uh, back to the proteins. Now, when we look at amino acids, again, I said there's the side chain, there's the, the main chain. Uh, side chains, in fact, have different features. Uh, these are the 20 amino acids. Two of these, R and K, have a feature, are typically described with a feature of being positively charged. And there again, we have the first issue. So this lysine and arginine are positively charged. But under some conditions, uh, histidine can be here. Histidine has a, a positive charge as well. So already the simple issue sort of breaks. But typically, R and K are the ones that are seen as positively charged residue. Uh, D and E 
are typically seen as the amino acids with negative charges. Then there are polar, polar amino acids, NQ, T, Y, and S. And again, so I'm giving you <coughs> solutions. Some people put the polarity of an amino acid or include other amino acids to be polar. So there is no one-to-one -one map. You cannot measure the polarity of an amino acid. You can only measure the probability. When you look at different measures for these, they will differ. What I unfortunately forgot here, uh, another feature that is very important is the hydrophobicity. Hydrophobicity essentially means the degree to which these amino acids wants to, want to stick to each other. Uh, hydrophobic means afraid of water. Uh, so they want to stick together. And now when you measure hydrophobicity, there's a hydrophobicity index. Have you heard about these hydrophobicity indices? Have you seen them? Anybody in the room ever heard of any Eisenberg index, uh, so Kai Doolittle index. So there is a database from 20 years ago when people, co uh, when a Japanese group collected 200 different hydrophobicity indices. And these 200, so each, no, not each one of those is an experimental, but most of those, or many of those, were measured by experimental means. So many of those reflect exactly that. To which degree two, do two amino acids stick together? Okay? And hydrophobicity is one of those features that everybody talks about. Some residues are hydrophobic, they stick together, they, stand, they are the parts that are in membranes. Hydrophobic means they, they like lipids, uh, they don't like water. That's why membrane helices, for instance, are also hydrophobic. Uh, we will get back to that later. But when they clustered these hydrophobicity indices, they saw that essentially you saw a cloud where there was not much of a clustering. So essentially you had 190 indices, some clustered. Many were very, very different from each other. Now, if you sort of measure hydrophobicity and you get very different results, that already tells you that this is not so easy. So the idea of hydrophobicity is they stick together. They want to be far away from border. Very simple biophysical concept. Why do you believe is it so complicated to measure it? Why do people measure it differently? What's the problem here? Can I just take an amino acid and just emerge it in a, into a solvent and, and measure somehow the resistance for getting out or the happiness being in border or something like that? Yes, I can. And that's exactly what the people measure. So why does it give different solutions? So the answer is, depending on what your assumption is about the background, it will differ. So whether the background, in fact, is pure water, or you put some salt in there. And as you know, that the environment of cells is not just pure water. Uh, there, there's a little bit salt in there. So that changes the story. That's the problem number one. Problem number two is whether you do this experiment on single amino acids or you do that on an amino acid that is in a peptide bond gives you a different answer. Now, the energetics of a protein really are energetics for this entire object. So it is not what's the hydrophobicity of any of these amino acid lysine in water. The question is, if the lysine is bound in a protein, and now I put the lysine into water. What is that hydrophobicity? And that will differ according to what the side chains next to it are. Okay? And there immediately you see how the story gets very complex. Or very complex is, is one way of saying it. How you can actually not find a single experimental measure that gives you a one-to-one -one map of what you want to measure. Okay? The best thing is the isolation. And again, in isolation, there are different ways of doing that. Uh, I'm running out of batteries. Um, okay, so one way of, of looking at what a protein is, is a, a protein is a sequence um, that falls into a particular uh, three-dimensional structure. By the way, there often is this, this image of secondary primary structure. So some people talk or call a sequence a primary structure, which I find very misleading. Then they talk about secondary structure, tertiary structure, which is the 3D structure, and then quaternity structure, which some people translate as 4D 
which is also slightly misleading. But anyway, what, what this means here uh, is simply the arrangement of proteins. The way two proteins bind together. ADH5, I showed you, has to be a homodimer to interact. And that is what you find often in books, quaternary structure interaction. I find these words a little bit misleading. Uh, but this is, this is very simple. This is 1D, structure, uh, 1D sequence. Uh, and this is 3D structure. And this is also 3D structure. This is a single protein. This is a protein-protein interactions. Uh, OK. Now, when we are getting back to the secondary structure uh, situation, there are, uh, again, there are the so-called dihedral angles. So the way the peptide bond is in a particular uh, plane, and the way two peptide, uh, two amino acids can rotate around each other here, uh, there are two angles that describe the rotation. And these two angles essentially with, with these two, you could describe 3D structures through these internal angles. So you can describe 3D structure as a point for every single C alpha in 3D space. Or you can describe it as a relative point with respect to the previous residue and then the two dihedral angles. Okay? Um, and the helix is essentially an object where you have a turn. So where you sort of turn back onto itself shown in this sort of black trace here, uh, while the beta strand is something where the amino acid sequence runs in this direction, and here's an amino acid sequence that could run in this direction or that direction, and the, the bonds here between these two parts of the, the chain are between this one here and this one, and then one, one, the two later, so uh, this is i, i plus 2, to I plus, if, if it's in the same uh, J plus 2, J plus J, so I and J, I plus 2 and J plus 2, if they are in the same direction or uh, else in the uh, minus, right? Uh, anyway, so this is referred to as a strand. Two, three strands come together in a sheet. The sheet, the idea of a sheet simply comes from the fact that there's the planner angle of a peptide bond, which makes it like a flat out sheet. These are flat, flattened out sheets. And the connection between uh, beta strands essentially is a sheet. Okay, Two beta strands together, or two or more beta strands together, form a sheet. Uh, can you spot the secondary structure here? No, you cannot. Or can anybody spot anything? Or something you can spot? No? I'm not talking about blue and red here. Uh, can you see, so what, what you have to spot are beta strands and uh, alpha helices. Can you see any of them? No? I think the structure on the value light is a alpha helix. Yeah. So this is this is an alpha. Oh, it changed the orientation. But this clearly uh, is an alpha helix here. Uh, there are beta strands in here. So I unfortunately turned it around here. So this is the alpha helix. Uh, I should have turned this more around. I'm sorry for that. It's an old slide. Uh, so now, essentially, this is, again, the same situation as before. Here, you have every C alpha is a sphere. Now, you have removed the sphere. And just the C alpha is one point here, OK? Nothing else has changed of the ones before. And you already see much more of secondary structure forming here. Uh, it's not quite true, so there's a, there's a little bit of a bend. But essentially, this is, what the, this is what it is. The difference between these two, essentially, is just reducing uh, overload. And you will begin to see helices more easily in this version here. You begin to see beta strands by simply stripping away some detail. The moment you put some colors into it, uh, most likely most people in the room begin now to see the difference here between alpha helices and red and beta strands. Again, then there are regions where you're not quite sure is this really helix here or not. Uh, but you now clearly, uh, and this, this one is a helix here, uh, but there's a wrong coloring. Um, OK, so again, here, here it's very clear. Alpha helices are stabilized by local interactions. So hydrogen bonds that stabilize a helix are between I residue I and some I plus 4 or something like that, but is relatively close in sequence. 
while the beta strand is stabilized by something, this is one chain, this is another chain, and they could come together from, from very far apart in the sequence. So these two uh, beta strands could be here, meaning that these two regions here, uh, if I stretch it out in terms of sequence far apart, in structure they come together, right? And for the alpha helix that is not the case. For an alpha helix, you form the alpha helix always by winding up things that are not directly close in sequence, but much closer, right? Um, so Ramachandran uh, studied electrical engineering, went to the Cavendish, Cavendish uh, lab in Cambridge, did crystallography, and looked essentially at the question when we look at alpha helices in collagen, what type of angles? So I said that you have two types of angles that can describe the protein structure, the, the two dihedral angles, uh, and he essentially plotted the space of possible dihedral angles that you would see. Uh, initially, he, he did that for collagen, uh, and then he observed something, a pattern such as this, and he said, well, you know, this essentially is where the alpha helices are formed. This is the region here for beta strands. Uh, so there are regions in this space of possible angles, dihedral angles. Uh, so again, every dot here is the dihedral angle of one particular amino acid in this structure, right? Uh, and so some regions here are visited, so the, the, you have points, and some regions you don't have points, meaning that those are sort of not allowed conformations in what today is referred to as the Ramachandran plot. And secondary structure uh, states such as alpha helices and beta strands immediately are visible because they occupy this region, beta str uh, alpha helices and beta strands occupy that region. So then there are these cartoons. Again, uh, cartoons is just the rod. I showed you in earlier already this rod structure and these arrows here. The arrows are very good at sort of showing that these two that are connected through hydrogen bonds are not completely parallel to each other. So there's some, some mobility in these sheets. Uh, that's what you can e easily see in this arrow representation. And again, this captures a reality that this one is not easily sh revealing. Um, then there are disulfide bridges, cysteine-cysteine contacts. Uh, let's uh, just keep it there. They're important for, in particular, extracellular proteins. Now, there are components of structures uh, referred to as domains. <coughs> One image of a domain, again, is you cut it out, it forms its own three-dimensional structure. So it forms a structure that is stable, always the same on its own. You know if there is the RNA, or the, uh, the gene, you have introns that are spliced out, and the red ones here is the final thing that will become the gene product. And an early idea was that, in fact, the introns are marking domain boundaries. Can anybody in this room comment on that? So introns are cut out, exons, I, I believe I said the wrong thing, Ex the exons mark the domain boundaries. Uh, one exon, one protein domain. Alternative splicing. Yes, but you could have alternative, so in fact that is uh, so some people argue that you would have a different way of domain composition and that this different way of domain composition is exactly how you get to a different function through alternative splicing. Okay, so, with the, so you don't derail this idea by alternative splicing because in fact uh, some people argue that this is exactly the strength of that idea. So the way you, you accumulate, so the way you connect domains in, uh, through alternative splicing is exactly the way you move around in this space. In fact, there are still many textbooks where you find this. It is absolute rubbish. Uh, but it is many, many, many textbooks, uh, in, in, in particular molecular biology, you still find this uh, statement that exon boundaries relate to domain boundaries. And in fact, again, some proponents of the um, alternative splicing idea carry, the, carry this further. Um, there is no data. I mean, the, whenever people who sort of understand structures and have a good de definition of domains uh, check, then this signal is just not true, okay? Uh, but it does not disappear from the textbooks. 
Uh, one thing that you often see is you have one organism here with two proteins, let's call them A and B, uh, and another pro organism here with one protein, C. Where, in fact, this domain is part of this now two-domain protein, while initially these two domains are part of two one-domain proteins. Why could that happen? And so very often the idea is that there is some sort of evolution going from here to here, meaning that this would be the organism, the earlier organism, and then there is a more advanced, that P2 is a little bit more advanced. Why, why would the advanced organism have something as a two-domain protein and then less advanced as one domain, two one-domain proteins? So why, 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 what could be the advantage of putting it into one protein? Any suggestion? One of the proteins can use the function of the other protein. That would be one, one way. So that, in fact, the way in order to make pro, uh, domain B active, you need A. Okay, so A activates B, and if you put that into one protein, you have sort of the activation trigger built in directly. So you don't have to first make them meet. One reason, yeah? I meant, uh, oh. like for example, baiting a molecule that interacts with protein A. So I'm not entirely sure what you mean by baiting now, but maybe the way to understand that is now there's a protein, there's some substrate that binds A and some substrate that binds B. And for these two substrates to, to, to make something happen, A and B have to be next to each other. If the, is that the way you see it? Mm. Is that the idea of baiting? Yeah. So in a yeast to hybrid kind of bait system mm -hmm. uh, uh, context where you suddenly produce light and this is the way you see protein interactions. So if that's what you imagine, then in fact this is again, this is a, another way we, we perceive this, that Protein C has the advantage that these two don't have to meet anymore. They are ready together, and you can now get the same response through a single molecule. And this is often exactly the way uh, it is explained why in some organisms we have proteins merged into multiple domain proteins that are single in other molecules. When we again think about domains, we think about modules, we think about this sort of being a sub-fragment of this. That fragment could be a domain or could be something smaller than a domain. In this image here from uh, Christina Rengo's group, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, five proteins. That's just the consensus motif. So a motif that all these proteins have. Uh, and essentially every symbol here is one domain. So you immediately see these are very long proteins with many domains. And you see that some of this domain structure is repeated in others, and some is not. So that sort of the consensus. So these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight domains are the same for all these proteins. And then every one has some addition to it. I believe there's none that, uh, 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 actually, it's not in all. So this one is even missing here. Uh, so. They, they all differ a little bit from, from, from this one here. And then mostly they have additions. Embellishment is what, what she is calling it. Uh, embellishment sort of additions in terms of motifs. And this is essentially the way proteins are built up. You have sort of a common theme. And you add a little bit here and there to it. And you could think about this in terms of domain. Or you could think about it in terms of domain plus a little bit more. We have another additional loop, okay? Now, one way in which you can identify domains from sequence alone is suggested by this one here. In this drawing, what I do is I simply superpose protein 1 and, or protein A and B such that it begins here, the protein A, and ends here, and protein B begins here and ends here. And in this region here, B and A are significantly similar in terms of their sequences, okay? And when you see this, you can guess domains. From this image, how many domains would you guess? And again, there, there are different answers to this question. But I believe one answer is relatively clear. Anybody can see a domain here? Maybe two? Most likely you would see it like this, right? Uh, domain one and domain two. That's one way of seeing it. 
Uh, and in seeing this, you would already see there are more than, than two domains here, because there is something that is at least sort of first ballpark looking in the length like a domain. So this would then be domain three somehow. Uh, and there is something here that is at least another domain, possibly two. Uh, possibly I could cut again here, not, not entirely sure. But most likely we have, on the image here, I have four or five domains, right? Uh, and then to be discussed what is in between. I could just be a linker. Uh, in this particular case here, when you look at the three-dimensional structures, uh, they may just look like that. Now, the, the problem is that biology, when, when, you, when, when it sort of uh, happens, is not that simple. Uh, and the problem, what happens, so this is one way in which this image could look. Uh, and this is another way, in fact, I call this dream and that reality uh, because we try to sort of find the cluster the universe of autoprotein sequences at some point, hoping that we would see a lot of these cases. Again, these cases are the ones that you find in every single textbook, but these cases are not the ones that you find throughout. You find many more of these cases where, in fact, to decide, so in this particular case, okay, you can cut here, you can cut here, but it doesn't really matter, right? Somehow there is something where they agree and something where they disagree. And when you have a little bit of overlap, you see that it really matters where you cut. And in fact, there is no single solution that makes sense to all of them. Okay? You, you begin to have an issue that a tiny difference may matter, and if a tiny difference may matter, then the problem is not well defined. Um, and so what I'm going to show you in the next image is a bunch of domain databases um, and sort of the length of these domain databases. So this is the average domain length, and this is the cumulative number of families. So let's begin with something that you may, some of you may have heard of. There was at some point a database called Blocks. And Blocks was essentially the idea of, in terms of sequence, it did exactly what I showed you before. It found regions where you could make this cut in a simple way. So where you have something that is completely aligned, well aligned, uh, and then you saw, uh, the more sequences you have, the, the shorter this gets. And this is why, in fact, you see that sort of almost all of the blocks here are shorter than 50 residues. And to, to put some point, I'm, I'm not entirely sure where the number here, so, so half of it, half of the blocks are less than 10 residues long or something like that, okay? Blocks are very short pieces. So this means that the algorithm that I described to you, again, which you find in every textbook and which I will use in this lecture a lot, actually does work. It, for, it worked for blocks uh, until about 10 years ago and it was a very famous database. And the more the database grew, the more this led to more cuts and made blocks essentially shorter. Because blocks were simply, in this very, very idea here, was simply the region that is common to them all, right? And the more sequences you added to the alignment, the shorter these things in between became. Uh, and that's the end of that, in some sense, that, that's the end of that algorithm. Uh, let's look at some other, uh, let's call it extreme way of looking at it. The extreme way, what I mean here is SCOP uh, in black. SCOP is a database of domains defined by three-dimensional structures. So now this is a subset of domains for which for every single one of those I have an expert assign a domain based on a three-dimensional structure. Okay, so for that one now we get the 50% point here is sort of 100 something. So if we believed SCOP, then an average domain would be around 100 residues. The problem with SCOP is SCOP is based on the protein database, PDB, and PDB is highly enriched in single domain proteins. Uh, bless you. Um, anyway, so this is most likely not the entire truth. Uh, then there's PFAM here. PFAM is on average slightly is below, so it's slightly lower than, than, than the SCOP. Do you guys know how PFAM is done? So PFAM protein family database uh, comes ultimately, the main person behind it is really Alex Bateman, uh, who used to be at Sanger. So it started at Sanger, actually it started at Stockholm, but um, then went uh, to, to, to Sanger. And 
ultimately the idea was, let's just do something that I showed you before, identify core regions and proteins, domains, and have an annotation about their function. So Alex Bateman essentially came to, to the job in the morning and did an alignment of, prote of the protein universe. And in the evening, sometimes there was a new PFAM record. And he has been doing that for many years. So today we have 10,000 annotated PFAM records. Uh, and it also has not only involved Alex, it has involved many, many, many people. But this is because on many occasions, Alex on Monday morning did not, at the end of the day, create a new PFAM entry. But sometimes it took a week to really do the alignment right. Uh, now, PFAM tries to capture the functionally important domain. And typically, PFAM, when you compare one-on-one -on -one for a protein family for which you have a PFAM record and the PDB entry, the PFAM is shorter. The blue is below the black. That means that it is longer. But that comes because PFAM is mostly, these this statistics here are done on different on apples and oranges, so to speak. Uh, for the PDB, we take only the, the proteins for which we have structures, and they are much shorter than the proteins that enter the blue. That's why the blue here is below. But on average, for, for the same protein, uh, PFAM tends to be shorter than what we would call a structural domain. It tends to be more a fragment <coughs> of a domain. So if you have a particular protein that binds DNA, then PFAM tends to sort of capture the DNA binding site, which is not the entire molecule. Okay? Uh, but then this graph also shows you there, there are a bunch of other proteins, uh, databases here, uh, and they, they differ quite a lot in terms of the degree to which they capture domains. So put it differently, if there would be a simple assignment of domains, then all of these databases would have the same line. Okay? The degree to which these expert databases differ shows you that the assignment of domains is highly complex. Now, even for cases, and that is missing on this slide here, even if I looked at proteins for which I have known 3D structures, there's an assignment from CAS, there's an assignment from SCOP, uh, and from some other database. I'm not entirely sure I get back to that. Uh, and they also differ quite substantially. OK, so Let's begin with some, uh, some, some simple statements. So longer proteins are rarer than shorter ones. Well, it always depends on how you say, what, what, what do you call longer, what do you call shorter. Uh, but it, on average, sort of this statement, let's call it right. What about the next statement? Prokaryotic proteins are shorter than eukaryotic proteins. True or not? Could be either or. Shoes. Do you, anybody has? Have you ever? Has anybody in the room ever heard any any yes or no on this? No. So the typical textbook uh, statement is that prokaryotic proteins, in fact, are shorter. Now, what this one shows here, uh, and the animation was a little bit too fast, is in blue the distribution of uh, eukaryotic proteins in green, prokaryotes, and archaea in red. Now you see that archaea and prokaryotes essentially are similar, and there's a lot of noise here, but you also see that for quite some fraction of the, uh, where, where most of the distribution lies, red, blue, and green are similar. So for a lot of proteins, eukaryotes are like prokaryotes. What makes them different is the tail. So eukaryotes, when you ask, for instance, wherever you put your number, but say, uh, what fraction of your proteins has more than 1,000 residues? Then that is, in fact, something where eukaryotes have 7% and prokaryotes have 1%. So this is where the big difference lies. But when, when I look at where the majority of proteins lie, right? for the majority, these functions look similar. For the majority of proteins, the eukaryotes and prokaryotic proteins are similar in terms of the length. Eukaryotic proteins have a lot of proteins that are very long. That's a big difference. Okay? Um, so the next issue is here some proteins are multi-domain. Most are not. Um, have you heard about that? Is that true or not true? 
pretty true. Uh, so that brings us to a, sh a short insert. How would I, in fact, identify domains? Essentially, one way in which you can do it is shown here. Uh, we take proteins for which we know the three-dimensional structure. We know the domain from, essentially, it forms a compact three-dimensional unit. We believe it can fold on its own from a 3D structure. You can sort of see that. So I have my protein here of unknown domains. domains. I find something in the PDB that is a known domain. I'm simply going to cut that out, OK? Uh, and then I say, OK, this is one domain. Then I have a little bit of a region here that is sort of a leftover. I throw that away. So in my next step here, I have to run this part. By definition, I cannot find anything of 3D structure anymore. So my next best thing to sort of guessing a domain is PFAM. So I find a PFAM region here. I cut. So in this particular case, now I have two, two, at this point, I have now two domains, one leftover thing and two that I can run. And say for these two that I can run, I find an example as the one that I showed you before, where you have a bunch of sequence or a bunch of organisms that have a, do, have a region here aligned, a bunch that have a region here aligned, so I believe it has two domains. So I cut again. Uh, and for the others, I don't, oops, uh, oh, darn animation, I'm sorry. Uh, so this one is still okay. Uh, so I cut again, and in this particular case, what, what it leaves me with is one, two, three, four domains, and then something gray where I don't have any reason to cut further. So the gray could be a domain, or could be something that is, is longer than a domain, okay? Uh, and when I ask how often do I find, according to these things here, this is the fraction for a large set of proteins, the fraction for which I see 3D domains. This is where I have PFAM. This is the Swiss prot kind of thing. Uh, this is most likely single domain, so that's so long that I believe. And this is sort of uncut. OK? Gives you some idea. Uh, and when I do this, then I see the answer how, how many proteins are single domain in blue. So only about less than 30% of all the proteins here in blue have a single domain. More, most proteins have more, they have two, so it's already more than one, three or more, right? So most proteins have more than one domain. The green shows you PDB. So the proteins for which we know the three-dimensional structure, 60% of those have a single domain. Why is that? Anybody has any idea? Why is the green so different from, from the blue? So the blue is, I believe, a good estimate, some estimate at least, of most proteins, while the green is the situation for all the proteins for which I know the three-dimensional structure. Why would that be different? It's easier, <laughs> it's easier to know one domain just than the next one. Exactly. People, in fact, because it's easier to do a structure for a single domain protein, people who do structure determination primarily begin with the single domain proteins. They pick out exactly all the single domains, or they cut the protein into single domain. Uh, that is why this is highly enriched in single domain. Uh, it's a choice. Now, anyway, uh, most, most proteins do, not, do have more than one domain. Uh, in fact, most multi-domain proteins have three or more domains. Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, there are more proteins with three domains and more than with one protein, one domain. So the, whatever you look at, the idea that a protein has a single domain is an exception in the universe of proteins. Okay? Uh, do prokaryotes have more domains than eukaryotes? Uh, and ultimately, the answer is this is sort of a per domain uh, eukaryotes in blue, prokaryotes in, in red. You see the number of fragments in the protein is not really that different. Ultimately, what comes to play here at the end of the day is that since eukaryotes are much longer, so some eukaryotic proteins are very, very long, they have more domains. And that's why this answer tends to be yes. But for an average domain, the length is relatively similar. In fact, what this also shows you is that sort of the first domain is a little bit longer. And then all subsequent domains here, so the, the way the, cur the line rises here is about 100. 
So an average domain is about 100 residues long, and the first one is twice as long, so roughly, right? Uh, gives you some idea. And that typically, the, the, the way to sort of explain that is for an enzymatic activity, you need more than 100 residues. <coughs> and for all the signaling molecules you put on top of the enzyme, you, you essentially can get away with 100 residues. That is somehow the interpretation of this, this curve. Uh, uh, do prokaryotes have more proteins with very many domains than eukaryotes? Uh, the answer we already know, yes, that's, uh, oh. Oh, that was a fast animation. Anyway, so that the answer was yes, uh, and you already saw that because the eukaryotes are, are very, very, very long. Okay, so that brings us to the point where we sort of can look at the space of proteins in different ways. We can sort of look at structure space, where everything is clustered according to having a similar structure, so everything that belongs to a similar structure is clustered together. We can look at the function space, so everything that is an enzyme or a particular type of enzyme is clustered together. Uh, and then we can sort of look at the space of experimental feasibility, treatability, uh, and then ultimately these are different ways of clustering proteins. Any way of clustering proteins ultimately is biology. What you initially start with, this could be a map created by sequence identity. So you have a bunch of proteins and you simply look at clustering them such or at uh, making points that are reflecting the distance but sequence identity or similarity or sequence differences, similarities between any pair of points. Okay? That gives you, say, this map. The moment you cluster, you have to sort of say some of these belong together. Okay? So you have to draw circles or something around it. You have to say, for instance, this is a cluster. And that moment is the biological interpretation. Okay? Uh, and this could, for instance, be a, a family here, and there could be subfamilies. And these subfamilies could be defined, this could be the family of all the proteins that have a similar structure. And the subfamilies could be defined by the ones that also have similar function, and there could be some overlap. So some may share the way they bind DNA, some may share uh, some other feature of, of, of their, their function. Okay. Proteins are fairly densely packed. There's a lipid bilayer around. Uh, if protein cells, I'm sorry. Uh, proteins come at very different sizes. Uh, they are defined by regular secondary structure. They are alpha helices, beta strands. You see them repetitively in almost every single in every single protein you see either helix or strand. Uh, there are exceptions, um, let's not get into that, but ultimately ret repetitive elements mean that when you look at a 3D structure you recognize these elements in it. They are relevant for energe the energetics of protein folding. We assume that the formation of secondary structure speeds up the folding process, uh, and they're important for function. So the inverse implies that the regions that are not regular signal structure, the lot helices, not beta strands, are less important, right? Often they are referred to as loops. Now, here's an example of uh, the glycoprotein 120, uh, the HIV envelope, uh, this glycoprotein attacking the T cell surface, that is the CD4, CCR5, and the slide comes from Nat Natasha Wood. Natasha Wood uh, happens to work on the question how HIV sort of gets into, into uh, people. That's the cell membrane. The CCR5 is on the cell membrane. That's the CD4 above the cell membrane. It's the viral membrane here. Uh, that's the GP120 trimer. And in fact, you see these loops here namely the V3 loop in this particular case. And the degree to which this V3 loop is mobile, the degree to which this V3 loop recognizes the virus is the major problem uh, for avoiding that the virus comes into the body. So they, she's really trying to sort of model what can we put into this loop, how can we change this loop, what would it require in this loop in order to, for the virus not to come in. And this is a function <coughs> of an element of of secondary structure that is not regular. It's a little loop that changes, and that, little, that change of that little loop is very essential for the biology of the story. Uh, the way this can, in fact, change in this particular case is that way is 
by glycans that are attached to this loop and by attaching different glycans you sort of can change the mobility of that loop. But overall again the most dominant segments of secondary structure alpha helices that are formed by local hydrogen bonds, uh, local in the sense I and I plus four, relatively close, so four residues apart in terms of sequence space, uh, while the beta strand, the other main element of secondary structure, the hydrogen bond formation is less local in terms of sequence. Okay? Um, and that gets